Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Amen. At this time, um, we're going to dismiss all the kids for Children's Church this morning. They're going to make their way upstairs. I want to thank the worship team for just leading us in worship this morning. What a privilege to, to have you guys and girls here leading us in worship. Just uh, wanted to, um, Joe did the announcements, but one thing he didn't uh, let you know is that we do have a nursery downstairs, and I see we have a lot of visitors here this morning who may not know about that, so if you have um, a small child here with you this morning, and any time during the service, you feel like you might need to get away, we have a nursery, just go down the, through that hallway there down the stairs, there's a live feed of the service down there, so you can still take part in the service, um, just want to let you know that's available. Um, title of my message this morning is uh, Straight Talk. And so, yeah, you're going to do intro? What? Yes, I was waiting for that. Warning, some listeners may find the following sermon offensive. I thought that was going to be the title page. Sorry, Greg. <laughs> Straight talk. There we go. Um, yeah. Some of you are going to find this sermon offensive. So I'm really, I, like, I'm usually glad to see visitors here. <laughs> and newcomers. But it just seems, like I'm so glad. Thank you for being here. If this is your first time, if you're visiting or you just have been here for a few times, this is not a normal uh, sermon for me. I'm just going to be, I, I'm even sitting down here. Even the way I'm going to present this message is different, and that's on purpose. Because um, I have a difficult message to preach this morning. But I believe it's, a, it's an important message. And I believe for some, it may be a message that actually changes your life. Yeah. But I believe for, for some, um, after you hear this message, you may not, you may not come to cheers again. So, <laughs> you know, I'm a little nervous about that. I've been, about 10 years ago, we moved here. It was 10 years ago on my birthday. Amanda and I moved here, and Joe and Olivia uh, we got here on my birthday. So we've been in Penticton now for 10 years, and we planted this church. And I, so I've been preaching in Penticton for 10 years. And for 10 years, I've never preached on this subject. And uh, there's a reason for that. It's because people hate it <laughs> when you talk about it. But and there's a lot of reasons why I've never done it. There's been times when I've preached on this topic, and I, I, where I've preached, and I've I've uh, kind of brushed along this topic. I kind of dipped my toe in the water. You know, maybe a little, a little, little short point in one of my sermons, and I would kind of dip my toe in the water, and you know what I found? The water was really cold. <laughs> um, and so then I'd back off. But I feel like here we are 10 years in, and I believe that there's a possibility, not a guarantee, but a possibility that the best is yet to come for this church. But I said there's a possibility. I, I don't believe it's a guarantee. And uh, because I, Joe and I haven't really ever talked straight about this, I think we've held the church back. And so, I just can't believe we have so many visitors on the day where I'm actually talking about it. So, but I believe it's really, really important, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and do that. And if you're visiting this morning, you're kind of in on a family conversation. And we're going to air our dirty laundry <laughs> in front of you. And so, usually my wife won't let us have company over unless the house is super clean. That's the way my house is. The house isn't clean this morning, but you're here, and we're going to air some of our dirty laundry, but I think it's really good 
I think it's really important. So I'm just going to pray. Father, speak to our hearts and change our life. In Jesus' name, amen. I uh, often love, we all love the story of Moses, and we especially we love that, the story of the burning bush, because that's when Moses' story just starts getting really good. In Exodus chapter 4, we have the, the story of the burning bush, and he, he meets God, he encounters God, he has an experience with God, he has a conversation with God, and God begins to tell Moses, here's my plan and purpose for your life. And it's to go back to Egypt and confront Pharaoh, and I'm going to use you to set people free. Moses at first says, I don't want to do it. I'm not capable of doing it, and I feel that way about myself when it comes to ministry. I've always felt that way, that, God, you should send somebody else. Um, but Moses relents, and he, he listens to God. And so he goes back to his father-in-law's house, and he picks up his wife and his son, and they start walking to Egypt in obedience to what God has shown him. And he starts walking to Egypt, and then we find this weird story in Exodus chapter 4. I'm just going to read it. It says, On the way to Egypt, at the place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him and was about to kill him. I've never, I never understood that. <laughs> like, why, have this, why would God have this incredible encounter with this man and change his life, and then just like maybe a day or two later, a completely different kind of encounter. But Moses' wife took a flint knife and circumcised her son, and she touched his feet with the foreskin and said, Now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. And when she said a bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision, and after that, the Lord let him alone. It's... It's a crazy story to me. It's crazy to me that God would say, here's your purpose. And in obedience, Moses starts walking towards his purpose. And then God just puts the brakes on and says, hang on a second. That's not guaranteed. Like I've shown you what's possible for you. But Moses, you are an Israelite and your son is an Israelite. And we have a covenant with Abraham. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why Moses was not faithful to that covenant. He was, made, he was you see, he, was, he wasn't raised in Israelite. He was raised in Pharaoh's home. And he didn't, he didn't have, you know, Israelite parents, Jewish, uh, religious Jewish parents who, would, who had taught him all these things. There was a whole bunch of reasons why Joe, uh, Moses could have said, hey, I, hey, Lord, I get a pass on this. But God was very clear with Moses on that issue that there's no free pass. And that Moses was an Israelite, and his son was an Israelite. And in that moment, God said to Moses, this is important. And before you can have what I've promised you, or what I've shown you, you need to be obedient in this area. I don't know about you, but if that was me, that would stay with me. I wouldn't put it in the background. I would, I would hold on to that and go, okay, God, is, he's, he's pretty serious about this. I, I would know that. I, I think I would. But then I realize I'm not Moses. He's one of the greatest leaders of his, uh, that the world has ever known. And yet he failed in that area. Because we fast forward 40 years, and I, I talked about this a couple years ago in my, in my message titled Move On. For Moses, in 40 years, all those people who were set free from Egypt, they find themselves again on the prep, uh, press, they're on the verge. <laughs> they're on the verge of stepping into what God has for them. I don't know why I lost that word all of a sudden. They're, about, they're, they're in the same situation as Moses, but it's 40 years later, God is showing them, hey, here's the promised land. Here's what we've talked about for 40 years. And, and Joshua is going to lead you into that. And Moses goes on the hill, and Joshua comes down, and we see it in Joshua chapter 5. It'll be on the screen here. 
Joshua comes down and he says, I've heard from God. And this is our promise. But it's not guaranteed. It's a possibility. But it's not guaranteed. And he comes down and he has a straight, he has a very straight talk with the people and he says, before we can have that, we have to be circumcised. It's funny because Moses, because Moses wasn't faithful in that area, these people are dealing with the same issues 40 years later. The very same issue that, I, I don't understand, I don't know why Moses, you know, when they got out of Egypt, didn't just do what God had told him to do. There's a whole bunch of reasons, a whole bunch of uh, thoughts, and a whole bunch of excuses Why? But now Joshua is stuck as a leader because he knows where God wants him to go. But he knows that there's a, pi- a price to pay before they can get there. And so he, as a leader, Joshua is standing before the people. And he's saying, this could be ours or we can just stay where we're at. But where we're called to go comes with a price. And I, what, I, what I really find crazy about this story is that the Bible gives us a lot of detail and it says he made flint knives. Like there's, there was no easy way for Joshua to broach the subject. There was no, you know, like sometimes when we want to preach a difficult sermon, we, we want to start with a funny story. And then sneak in a little bit of a, a, little, a little bit of a jab here and there. We want to kind of soften the blow. There was no way for Joshua to soften the blow. Like he sees, he gets some guys. He just start making knives out of rocks, and we're going to do some surgery. It's like this is going to be bloody. This is going to be messy. This is going to be painful, but it's necessary. And so Joshua gives him the information, and every single one of those men who was, was of age had to make a choice. Am I going to surrender to this? Like, am I going to stand there or lay there, however they did it, and let this man actually do what he wants to do? Or am I going to pull back and say, I don't want the pain? See, I believe that's where we are as a church. I didn't want to share this message because I've, I've <clears throat> time, too many times in my 10-year experience here at Cheers, I've, I've preached from my heart. And not all the messages have been easy to preach. And too many times have I had people who've sat in this building with me for three, four, even five years come up to me after sermon after sermon and say, oh man, this church has changed my life and all oh, that message is for me and oh, I don't know where I'd be without this or without that. And then I preach a message that kind of hits home in a difficult way. And that quickly people can turn. Anybody who's been in ministry, you understand what I'm talking about. And I understand that this is a message That could cost relationships. I'm talking about money today. So people, you know, I've said it now, so people are offended. I just want to share uh, some stats with you. And um, it should be on the, uh, the screen here. Christianity Today in 2013 did a study, and the study found that tithers comprise only 10 to 25% of families in the church. But they often provide 50 to 80% of the funding. So I know by sharing this message today, there's a good possibility that I'm going to offend 90 to 75% of the people here today and people listening online, people who, you know, have been my friends and 
have been very uh, complimentary of my preaching in the past. And so I, I don't preach or share this message with a, a, you know, there's no joking. There's no, uh, I have to sit down because my natural tendency when I preach is to stand up and start yelling and screaming and, you know, just go with the flow and let it all, you know, just let it all go. But I want to keep this very subdued. I want to keep it very serious because I believe this is very, very important to the, his, the future of this church. You know that Joe and I, we love David. When we look at David's life, there's, all, you know, I think so many victories, but it's where, it's when David fails that I've learned my greatest lessons from his life. The, the most famous failure that we all kind of gravitate to is, of course, the one with Bathsheba, David and Bathsheba and Uriah. We always kind of look at that and we say, well, this is David's lowest point in his life. It doesn't get any worse than this. And, of course, David's confronted by the prophet, and David responds with repentance. And he, he writes Psalm 51, and I just got a little a clip of Psalm 51 on the screen. It's, he, David wrote these words. He said, you do not desire a sacrifice, or I would offer one. You don't want burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. When David committed that sin. He was a man of means. He was a man of great means. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of wealth. And God was upset with David. David had sinned. There was no way around it. He couldn't deny it. But what David was saying at that time is he could have sent a servant out. And he could have said, you know what? I've, I've kind of ticked God off. So I need you to go down to the market. I need you to buy a thousand cattle. I need you to take it to the priest. I got to appease God. Let's get this dealt with and move on. That would have been easy for David to do. It wasn't, David had all the money in the world. He had all the resources in the world and he could have offered a thousand sacrifices. But he understood in that moment that if he just went through the spiritual motions, it, it wasn't what God was looking for. In that moment, David said, this isn't about a physical act of worship. This is about a broken and contrite heart. It's about being real and true and honest with God. And he writes this great psalm of repentance. And I always feel like, like talk is cheap. Like only God know, only God will know when we repent. If we're, like we, you can, we can fool other people with our words, but if somebody's truly repentant, God knows the heart. And in this case, God knew David's heart. And David, the, the, it, was, it was true and God accepted his, his repentance. God forgave him. There was a lot of pain that came from this situation, but God restored David. And it was all because of repentance. An act, uh, it was words, but they were sincere and they were from the heart. But we see in First Chronicles, we see another story, and it's a story when David, he, he did a census. He wanted to count his fighting men, and all his advisors said to David, look, you don't need to do this. You just need to have faith in the Lord. And they, they advised David that this is sin. David's um, desire to count his men and to, to, to know how many he had was actually rooted in pride. And David went against his advisors and God actually got very upset and there, a plague came upon the land. And people were dying. And so David understood that it was a result of his sin that this plague came. And let's just read it. So David goes to buy a field, a field. Let me buy this threshing floor from you at full price. And then I will build an altar to the Lord there so that the plague will be stopped. Take it, my Lord, the king, and use it as you wish. The owner said, I will give you oxen for the burnt offerings and a threshing boards for the wood to build a fire on the altar and the wheat for the grain offering. I will give it all to you. But King David replied, no, I insist on buying it at full price. I will not take what is yours and give it to the Lord. I will not present burnt offerings that have cost me nothing. I will not offer to the Lord that which cost me nothing. And so we see in David's life that there's a spiritual and there's a practical. Like, you know, in one instance, it was, I, I've got to, I've got to, 
repent wholehearted before the Lord, and it was him on his face before God. It was, it, 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 what financially it didn't cost him, but it was true and it was real from the heart. And then we see in this other situation, he could, he could simply go to that place again. He could simply go with words, and then he, but he goes with an offering. It's like Joe just shared that story about Justin. We love, we, we, we love those stories. We love the spiritual. We love that. We love that Justin prophesied over those people and he moved in the power of the Holy Spirit and people got saved. But what made that possible was churches who support him financially. Like the spiritual doesn't happen without the natural, without being faithful in the natural, the spiritual couldn't have happened. Israel's breakthrough was determined on their level of obedience in the area of circumcision. It was painful, it was uncomfortable, it was messy, but it was necessary. The North American church struggles and wanders in the wilderness because we're faithful in every area but the financial. I believe there's people in this, in this room today and people who are watching online, I believe that there's people just like Moses, you, you sense and you know that God has something more for your life and you've been willing to offer prayer. You've been willing to offer the prophetic word. You've been willing to walk into the door of a church and worship exuberantly. You've been willing to offer a whole, a whole lot of spiritual things. But the one area in your life where the breakthrough lies is being faithful in the area of finances. I believe that we become very comfortable offering to the Lord that which costs us nothing. That's been our go-to. I preached a sermon and I showed a video clip about the underground church in China and they're meeting in a cave. When those people meet together to pray, that costs them something. When they meet together to worship, that costs them something. When the pastor gets up to preach a message, that costs them something because if the wrong people are in that room, if you're in a, if you're, you know, we're here we are in beautiful Penticton, B.C. on a beautiful Sunday morning and we're all here and we all, and no one's afraid, uh, no one's concerned. But if you're in an ISIS hold stronghold territory right now and you're meeting with a group of believers, let me tell you, that worship comes with a cost. That prayer service comes with a cost. That sermon comes with a cost. What we're doing here this morning does not come with a cost. I, when I was in grade 12, I wanted to make a change in my life. I was always this very shy, um, slightly overweight, um, awkward kid. And so I decided that I wanted to get into <clears throat> working out. I had all kinds of reasons. It, it was pride. Pride was my main motivator in that. And... Um, I had this goal, I, and my goal was I wanted to be stronger, I wanted to be bigger, I wanted to be more appealing to other people. Um, and that motivated me. And I would go, and we, I had access to this school gym, and so I would go, when I was in grade 12, I would go to the school gym every day, and I would work out, and I started seeing results, and I liked what was happening, and, it was, and I, was, we, I was moving slowly towards the goal that I had for myself. But then I graduated, and I got a job. I got a job in an industrial supply store. I rented a basement suite in Quinnell, and I bought a little beater car, and I bought insurance and, and all that kind of stuff. My job was a minimum wage job. So all these things were, were beginning to add up. My problem was I still had this goal. I wanted to get bigger. I wanted to get stronger. I wanted to become more appealing to, well, to the opposite sex. And... Uh, um, 
but I didn't have access to the high school gym anymore because once you graduated, you couldn't go on school property. So now I had this goal, but I was living in a reality that I never lived in before as a teenager. And the reality is, nothing's free. Like, it's just not free. I still wanted to go, I still wanted to work out. But now there was going to be a cost with working out, a financial cost. And so, after I had rented my place and bought my car and paid my insurance, there wasn't, and I was on a minimum wage job, there wasn't a lot left over. And I still wanted to work out. So here was the problem. I wanted to work out and I had this goal, but I also wanted cable TV. <laughs> I wanted them both. And, um, and I looked at that and I said, you know what? I want to work out and I want cable TV. But the cable TV, although, you know, it's nice, it's not going to get me closer towards my goal. In fact, I'll probably sit on the couch and watch TV and eat potato chips, and it's actually going to take me further away from my goal. And so at that, I had this dilemma. It's not that I couldn't afford the gym. It was that I couldn't afford both. And so I had to decide which I valued more. And at that point in my life, I valued the gym more because it moved me towards my goal. See, I believe a lot of Christians say they can't afford to tithe. But I just really believe it's just because they can't afford both. I can't afford to tithe and fill in the blank. I can't afford to tithe and have a brand new vehicle, so I'm going to choose a new vehicle. I can't afford to tithe and... Go out for, you know, get Starbucks every day, so I choose the Starbucks. I can't afford to tithe and this. The reality is, where we put our finances is what we value. And I valued at that season of my life the gym more than I valued the cable television. I worked in a restaurant from one of my first jobs. My very first job was I was a busboy a dishwasher at Ricky's restaurant. I was so good at dishwashing, I got a promotion to busboy. And you know, you greet people, take them to their seat and everything like that. The, the busiest day of the week, Sunday. In Van- we, this was Maple Ridge. I was work, working the busiest day of the week was Sunday. And you knew exactly when that rush was going to hit because the churches would get out. And then church people would come. This is not a great... Uh, commercial for church people because every no one wanted to work Sundays. You know, it was the church people were very demanding people, to be honest. And uh, we would get our regulars every Sunday. It would be the same people every Sunday. They would get to know your name. You get to know their name. And as a greet, as a bus boy, I would greet them at the door. Hey, good to see you this Sunday. Hey, smoking and on, right? That's when you could have non-smoking and smoking sections. They would all say because they were with all the church friends. They'd all say non-smoking. Uh, they're non-smoking. Okay, so we get into non-smoking, and uh, can I get you a coffee? Yeah, I'll get you a coffee. Can I get you a water? What, is there anything else you need? We're here to serve you. And uh, that was great. Because we knew that if we serve them, um, at the end, of the, the end of that meal, we were going to give them a bill. And guess what? A hundred percent of the people paid their bill. And then when we, said, when we brought them their bill, they didn't even get offended. And the majority of them actually paid more than the bill asked. Because that's how society works. Like when I... When I Decided to join that gym. This is before I had to interact or we had all those, you know, direct deposit and all that kind of stuff. So every, every, the first of every month, I would, take, I would get $30 out of the bank. And when I showed up at the gym, I would put the $30 in the counter. He'd write me out a receipt and I'd go work out. But there were times, because I was 17 and 18 or however old I was, I would neglect to bring the money with me. It would be like the third of the month and I've already had like three workouts. And the gym owner... 
who was much bigger than me, would come up to me and he would say, you can finish your workout today, but your dues were due three days ago. And, you, and, and, and I would say, hey, man, I'm sorry. I completely forgot. It slipped my mind. And I would either go get the money after my workout or I, or I wouldn't show up again until I had the money with me. And I wasn't, I wasn't offended because I kind of did understand that he had, he had to pay his staff. He had to buy the gear. He had to pay his rent. He had to pay the lights. And I just, I kind of understood that there were some responsibilities that this man had. And his responsibilities were determined on me keeping my commitment to him. But I've broached this subject before. I've talked about it. Tiny, tiny bit. Oh, you care about his money. Yes, because that's all I've talked about for 10 years is money. Yes, because we're probably the only church you've ever been in that doesn't hand out an offering plate. But the moment, it's interesting that we wouldn't treat a secular business the way we treat the house of God. This, like I said, this is straight talk. And it's bloody and it's messy and... See, we go to these restaurants every Sunday and we say, hey, man, I'm here because I like the food. The food is good. Service is great. We, we look at the restaurant, the menu, and we say, give me this, get me this, get me this. And we get the service and, and we like this restaurant. But when we, when we get our bill, we don't just say, hey, God bless you. And we don't just say, hey, tell, hey, let, hey, let, the, let the chef know. That was a good meal. I am full. I am stuffed. And we're coming back, we're coming back again next week. We're going to be praying for you all week. I, I look, I, I see there's some other people. I, I think there's good, this is probably a pretty decent restaurant, so there's a good chance 25% of other people are paying their bill. So we'll come back next week. We like the service. We like the food. We like it all. But if we did that to the restaurants of this town, you know how many restaurants we would have in this town? If you were a contractor and you built a house for somebody and 10% of the people paid the bill, but they said, hey, I'm going to refer you to a friend because I like your work. We don't do that because we, we understand that the laws of society, like there's just this etiquette in society, even amongst non-believers, that we all have to do our part. And we, we're not in high school, and we understand nothing's free. But it just boggles my mind that we walk through the, thresholds, the threshold of a church, and we think the rules of society stop at that door. And then we hide under a cloak of spirituality. And we offer a song, we offer a prayer, we offer a prophetic word, we offer that which costs us nothing, and we feel good about it. And the church struggles. I went to a Bible college. That also wasn't free. And... Uh, I went down to the gospel mission. That's what my ministry was as a freshman. I went down to the gospel mission. It's a soup kitchen. And we, it's all volunteers. Everybody's a volunteer. And we make food, and then people line up at the, it was a bus. It was a big blue school bus, and it was a kitchen in there. And we'd make soup and buns, and people would line up, and you would pass them their soup and their bun. And most of the people were pretty appreciative. What you would think you would be because you're eating for free, right? You're getting a free meal. Um, but I'll never forget it when this guy came up. It was chicken noodle soup or whatever it was. And he looked at this and he said, we had this two days ago. And he took it and he threw it at the bus. And it went all and it's just the soup splashed everywhere. All over the volunteers. 
all over the people around him. He didn't like his free meal. I've never been in a, I've never been in a situation where I've had to use a soup kitchen to survive. But, but I would like to think if I was in a place where I was getting a free meal, everything was given to me for free, that I would appreciate it. I would like to think that I wouldn't make all sorts of demands on the volunteers. It just, it, what I'm saying is, to my experience, that people aren't afraid to make great, great demands of the church. We want to pay soup kitchen prices, but we want the five star, five star service. Like I said, this is straight, this is really straight talk. I'm not coming at this as, you know what, you, you give and God's going to bless you tenfold. We've all heard those sermons. I'm not making those promises. I'm just, I'm just giving you the straight goods. That 90 to 75% of those who attend church on a regular basis want to pay soup kitchen prices but expect five-star service. And the church suffers for it. And it, you know what? Please don't leave here saying, well, he's saying if I don't tithe, I can't attend church. No, that's, the church has always been there. It's always been there for everybody. But if I ever did find myself in a place or a situation where I needed a soup kitchen to survive, you know what? My goal would not be to stay in that place. My goal would be to do whatever it took to move out of that place and get to a place where I was healthy and whole and I could support my family. And one day, I could volunteer at the soup kitchen and give back. I believe there's a possibility that the best days of this church are ahead of us. But this is our circumcision moment. It's not rah, rah, come to the altar and we'll pray for you. Because we've done that. We've done that a lot. We've done that for 10 years. And we really believe in that. By preaching this message once, please don't let that make you forget the 10 years that I've preached about the spiritual things. I believe your best years could be ahead of you. I believe the dreams and visions that God has placed in your heart for your life could be ahead of you, but I'm going to ask you, have you become very comfortable offering to the Lord that which costs you nothing? Because if you have, that might be the reason you're not moving forward. And here's what I'm going to, I'm going to make you a promise. I'm going to make you a promise. And the promise is this. If you come to me, and you talk about wanting breakthrough in your life. From this point on, my first, question, my first question to you will be, do you tithe? I can't speak for Joe, but I think he's on the bus. I think he's on with me. <laughs> we're, we're looking to hire a full-time guy. I'd suggest go to him. He hasn't heard this message yet. And it's not because I want to get something from you, but I just believe that 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 we can do all the other things, but if we're not willing to do this thing, I think we're stuck. I think for 10 years, we focused on all the other things, but because the water was frigid, I, I, I never wanted to jump in, but today I just dove right in, and I'll find out what the consequences are <laughs> later today <laughs> or tomorrow or what kind of Facebook message I get. Maybe I'll get blocked on Facebook. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I, you know what? I just, I just want to be real. I just want to be truthful. It's been 10 years. And I believe for somebody, this is going to be a huge, huge breakthrough. I think that's it. I think that's it. Why don't we pray? Father, I thank you for your Holy Spirit. And I thank you, God. 
that there, if there's any condemnation in this room, Lord, I just come against that right now in Jesus' name. Lord, this message was never meant to, bring, to be condemning towards anyone. Or I just pray for a spirit of conviction, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would truly be a people who are like David and who prayed, search me, Lord, and try me and show me, God. Lord, I love you and I love this church and I, I truly believe that we could have the best days of the history of this church ahead of us, just around the corner. Lord, we want to be people who are, who are pure of heart, like David, who just offer you our heart. But Lord, we also, I pray I, that you would give us the courage and the strength to be a people who don't just offer you that which costs us nothing, but Lord, that we would be a people that move your church forward by our obedience in this area. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you. The Lord, be gracious to you. The Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Be blessed as you go. And my promise to you is my next sermon will not be about money. In Jesus' name, amen.